Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm super excited that we've all kind of joined us for this vulnerable adolescent um, section of our um, adolescent week. Um, I'm going to basically stay mute and just help run the session because I'm going to hand over to two incredible speakers. We've got Jess McDonald who works for Red Thread. She's got um, years and years of amazing experience uh, with young people, um, particularly women, who have suffered sexual violence. In fact, her title, I've had to write it down because it's so long, is Violence Against Women and Girls Lead lead um, for Red Thread and she's based down at St George's and she essentially does incredible work kind of picking up young girls who have been victims of violence and ensuring they get the right support and she's massively passionate about ensuring that happens and I'm thrilled she's come to speak to us today about um, sexual violence and basically stuff that we worry about as clinicians we don't know what to do with and hand over to Jess is going to explain her work and then we've got Dwayne Allen who works for Oasis of Youth he's based at St Thomas's which was why like Emma and Dwayne were just having hellos there, because uh, obviously Emma Parrish is basically Evelina. And he has a background in education originally, of which he was a teaching assistant, and then kind of really did some work with some vulnerable young people and recognised that he kind of wanted to go into the youth work section. And he deals with um, young people who are dealt essentially dealing with um, violence and gang kind of violence. And he's done this incredible talk for us. Um, if anything, we're, not, we're probably squeezing a lot into an hour, so forgive us if we go over, um, but we have been talking about trying to run this session again over a longer time period. Um, please, please, please fill in the feedback because it's really important for us to kind of learn, but also for Jess and Dwayne to get feedback because they have given up their time um, to do this um, for us. And also, I remind you if anyone um, wants to join YPSIC, which is the young person's kind of um, subgroup of the Royal College of Pediatrics, there's, there's um, a link to do so. So I'm going to stop talking and hand back to Jess. Any, there's going to be some interactive bits to this session, so please um, drop your comments in the, the chat and I will have a little look. As always, keep yourselves on mute just because of background. You're quite welcome to put your face up if you wish to. It's up to you. And I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to Jess. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, as Jet said, my name is Jess. Uh, I'm the Violence Against Women and Girls lead for Red Thread. Um, and she's very right. I've been based down at St George's Hospital for the last uh, three years, although uh, my new role means that I'm going to be moving away from more frontline practice. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about that as we as we go. So first things first, Najat, could you move the next slide? Yeah, my slide has just gone. So keep talking while I try. <laughs> okay. to the first thing I really want to to get talking with all of you about. Um, here we go. Perfect. Is what do you think of when you hear the term serious youth violence? So if you could all um, pop something into the chat box. Uh, about any kind of words that come up, any sort of themes, maybe other trainings that you've been on, just to get a bit of a flavour for who's in the room and, and what people are thinking. Okay, so injuries, stabbings, yeah. Phase two are very, very quick. Trauma, nice. Exploitation, multiple injuries and trauma, rape. God, these are all very positive terms, aren't they? Gangs, multiple vulnerabilities, that's very interesting, yep. Serious, organised crime, victims. Epidemic, now that's an interesting word. I'm not totally surprised that I'm hearing a word like epidemic given the, the context of the training setting that we're in, but yeah, very much agreed. Bereavement, yep. I'll just give you guys, say, 10 more seconds to see if anyone else has any ideas. I guess the reason basically that I'm asking you all to think about this is oh, drugs, education, county lines, great. Dwayne is gonna cover loads of this stuff later on as well, which is excellent. Um, the reason I'm asking you all to think about this is because very commonly, serious youth violence is not thought about in a, as a, um, an issue that particularly affects our female population. Um, and in fact, I would challenge that or refute that very, very strongly. Um, Red Thread, uh, we work with both young women and uh, young men who come in as, as, um, as a result of serious violence and exploitation. Um, and it's really important that young women are not left out of this conversation, that we're considering their needs. They are very specific needs. And we're not just considering them in the in, as a kind of, um, in inverted commas, collateral damage uh, aspect of serious violence. Okay, next slide, please, Emma. 
Oh, no, Jack, sorry, and I'm looking at the chat. So who we are, and again, next slide. Let's just explain a little bit about who Red Thread are, and then we'll move on. So um, we are based across a number of hospitals across the capital, so across London. We're also based in two hospitals in Birmingham and also in Nottingham. So our reach is, is getting wider. Um, we have youth workers, um, youth work specialists who are embedded into the A&E department. So whenever a young person comes into hospital, aged 11 to 20, or 11 to 24 in some cases, uh, and we're concerned about serious use violence or exploitation, then the clinical staff, so that's you guys, uh, will make a referral and one of our youth workers will come down and have a conversation with that young person. So within that, what we're looking at are both the reachable opportunities for young people, but also these teachable moments. It's really important that we don't just think about teachable moments as something that happened to young people, um, because us as professionals, and I include everyone on this call, is teachable as well. Um, and it's really important that that is a kind of a symbiotic relationship and that it's not a one way thing. Um, the reason that we refer to them as reachable and teachable moments is basically because uh, coming into hospital as a result of serious violence or exploitation is an opportunity for us to speak to young people who are outside of their norm. Uh, it is not what they woke up that morning expecting to happen, and it is often a very isolating and intimidating at times experience. Um, so we use this time to really explore with them uh, about what has happened that's led up to this moment, but we don't focus on that as much as what's gonna happen next. What can we do to help create positive growth following this hospital attendance? So that in a nutshell is our serious youth violence or our, um, we call it our YBIP, so our youth violence intervention program across all of our sites. We also offer um, at a number of our hospitals a domestic violence service. So we have specialist youth IDVAs um, who actually work for Solace and we second them across. They are absolutely brilliant. Um, and they'll have conversations with young males or young females where we're concerned about domestic abuse. Um, as you can see on this slide, we also have our chaos um, project, which is based at King's, and that's the uh, King's Adolescent, Adolescent Outreach Service. So they um, are youth workers, again, specialist youth workers who go and work with young people who are uh, attending hospital due to chronic illness or are in hospital for long periods of time, and they're offering them support to engage with their health plans, but also with other multiple needs that they may have. Um, and then we also have our social switch program. So that's in conjunction with Catch 22 and with Google. Um, and the idea behind Social Switch is to educate practitioners uh, around everything to do with social media um, and anything that, yeah, social media essentially. But we also have, there is also a program for young people to attend themselves to think about uh, how they might access careers within uh, social media and um, technology. So I, I would implore you to have a have a Google, have a look, because there are um, social switch do offer training, which any of you could sign up for. So so go and have a look at that. Uh, next slide, please, Najet. Oh, ah, here we go. So in a nutshell, this is what our intervention looks like. So when we're in the hospital, when we come down to meet with a young person, be that a young male or a young female, we're assessing their very basic needs in that moment. So that may be as simple as, do, does anyone know that they're here? Do we need to contact someone? Do we need to let a parent know? Do we need to let a carer know? Whoever that is. Um, we also de-escalate conflict when it does happen within the hospital. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are stopping fights. In fact, that is not what that means at all. Um, but, it, but we do have young people who are coming in having experienced significant trauma, and that can sometimes play out uh, in, in ways that can be viewed as potentially aggressive. Um, we would argue that that young person is, is scared and intimidated by the situation. So often we will work with that young person to kind of de-escalate and to, to, to help them out with that. Uh, we're also assessing their peer group. Uh, we're translating medical concepts. You guys all speak this wonderful language called medic, um, but not very many other people do. So a lot of our job is to try and translate between that. Um, we also make police proceedings less obscure, so we're explaining to young people why the police are present if they are present, and sometimes helping out our clinical colleagues as well with the police presence, where that can sometimes feel a bit overbearing. Um, and we're also contributing to social care referrals. So the hospitals are the lead agency in terms of making sure that that referral is made, but we'll be ensuring that we are um, 
providing any information that's given to us, to our clinical colleagues, but also making sure that that's passed on to social care to make it as robust a referral as possible. So that we're being really expressly clear about what our, our um, concerns are. So it's really important essentially that whilst young people are in the hospital, that they don't feel abnormal, um, but equally that they understand and they know what is going on, which might feel slightly unusual to them or very unusual to them, to be honest. Um, and it's really important that they understand that what's going on for them is as a direct result of the concern that's brought them in. So a lot of our job is really just imparting that message again and again and again. And then after discharge, our uh, role is to ensure that young people are continuing to access their healthcare. So if they have any ongoing appointments, uh, we're monitoring any ongoing risks. So we are doing... Um, live risk assessments constantly so they're they're not static in any way they're constantly updated we're advocating for them to have safe housing which may sound basic but it's actually something that a lot of our young people don't have access to um, we're working with them in identifying employment education or training opportunities supporting them in terms of mental health support or counseling so making those referrals and ensuring that their young that their voice sorry is being heard in their ongoing support plans that's really really important um, I should say at this point that all of our um, all of our work is consent based. So young people are well within their rights to say that they they don't want to work with us and that they're not interested in having these conversations. If that's the case, we will try to persuade them that um, it would be good to at least explore safety planning, to at least explore um, what options are available to them. But this intervention is really there for them when it feels right. And sometimes we have to sit with that. Um, with the knowledge that actually that young person doesn't feel that the time is right. They can access us at any point in the future. So if they change their mind, they can walk back into the hospital, they can give us a call, whatever works, and we will offer to support them at that point. So we have had young people, for example, walk back into the A&E um, reception and say, are those red people still there? And the answer is yes, we are. And we'll come down and have a chat. Um, next slide, please, no chat. So... Specifically, I'm here to talk to you today about our Young Women's Service. So this is our Young Women's Service, um, all of our mugshots, for want of a better phrase. Um, so we work with young women uh, and girls aged 11 to 24 across London. Um, so we have, uh, as you can see here, we have Fee based at King's, we have Frankie based at St George's and we have Tanya based at St Mary's. Um, so we have a broad, broad reach um, from our major trauma centres. Um, we work with young women who come into hospital where we are concerned about one of four things in general. We try to keep it broad though, but in general, it's these four things. So either we are concerned that this young woman is actively involved or we strongly suspect that she is actively involved in some form of pro-criminal activity. So that could be that she's involved with um, drug supply or county lines, as it's often called. It could be uh, that she's carrying weapons, whatever that looks like. Uh, we also work with young women where we know or strongly suspect that their peers or their family members or their partner are involved in such activity. Um, we also work with young women who are living in areas where we are concerned about the level of pro-criminal activity or violence that we're seeing in that area. So, and at this point, often people argue, well, that could be literally anywhere in the country, um, given that we know that serious youth violence and exploitation happens everywhere. Um, the, the answer to that is yes, it could be. Um, however, what we have seen a significant number of referrals for young women regarding is when they come into hospital having witnessed an incident such as a stabbing or a shooting or an assault of some sort. And that has therefore, um, that has then gone on to, to lead to them having some kind of medical condition themselves. Generally, that would be mental health related. Um, we also work with young women, and this tends to be our younger cohort, but not exclusively. Um, we work with young women who come into hospital who are stating things like uh, my boyfriend's in a gang or I'm in a gang or uh, my brother's in a gang, my mate's in a gang, whatever that is. Um, our role is not to necessarily ascertain at that point in time if that is accurate or not. Um, but we know by the very nature of us saying those words that this places these young women in a, in a, in a vulnerable position. Um, it is it is often, well, not often, it is a safeguarding concern um, when young people are stating that they are involved um, because 
we know that that potentially um, means that they are liable to grooming, to exploitation. Essentially, if anyone was to come to them, they feel that they're already involved anyway. Um, it's something that they, in inverted commas, aspire to um, in terms of a lifestyle. And that's something that we would be really worried about. So we work with those young women as well. Same as the rest of the thread thread, we are consent based. So it is entirely up to a young woman if she would like to work with us or not. And our offer is that we will support them for roughly a year in the community post discharge. And that could be with all number of different factors. So that could be with things like uh, identity, it could be with things like helping them ensure that they understand their rights, uh, exploring relationships, that could be peer relationships, that could be familial relationships, that could be intimate relationships. Um, we work on a model of sort of advocacy to self-advocacy, so we want to empower our young women that when we're no longer around, um, they are able to, to verbalize and to um, access support that they, that they deserve. Um, and again, we have practical support, so that might be around benefits or ETE or housing, whatever that looks like. Um, next slide, please, Najet. Oh, here we go. So the sorts of things that we see coming into hospital, um, as it says here, we see far more than just violence related injuries. We do see violence related injuries and it's really important to recognize those. Um, they may be weapon or non-weapon related, um, but really commonly we see uh, referrals for young women with mental health breakdowns. In fact, last year, 69% um, of the young people who were referred to us where the, the concern was that they were suicidal were for young women. That's a disproportionate number compared to the young men that come in. So we need to really think about why that might be. Um, we also saw nearly double referrals for young women um, as opposed to young men when it came to overdose and poisoning as a referral reason. So again, that's something that we need to really strongly consider. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those individually because you can read them all yourselves, but when we're talking about things like accidents, for example, we're talking about um, things maybe where the injury doesn't match the mechanism, and those are really important to look out for. Um, when we're talking about gynecological concerns, for example, what we're talking about is things like PV bleeding, suspected or known pregnancy, STIs, those sorts of things. Really importantly as well are those unexplainable medical conditions. So those young women that are kind of repeat attenders potentially that keep coming in with things like stomach pain, where no matter how hard you try, you cannot locate the source of that pain. Um, those are really important young women for us to be aware of, um, and we would be wanting to ideally have a conversation with them. Najat, could I have the next slide, please? So additional factors. So what is it that make young people eligible or, or fit the remit of the Young Women's Service? So here we're talking about things like uh, witnessing violence, as I mentioned. So we've had young women who've come into hospital with all sorts of complaints, um, physical complaints, so um, and mental health complaints following witnessing violence. I don't think we can actually underestimate what that does to our young people and the trauma that that does in part. Um, interestingly, when we're thinking about multiple sexual partners, we very regularly have referrals for young women where that's the referral reason or the concern. Um, I'm not aware of any that we've had for young men. Um, so it's interesting if we think about the, the gender bias uh, within that and why we're concerned about multiple sexual partners for young women versus why we're maybe not so concerned or maybe why we're not asking um, young men. Uh, when we're thinking about things like CSE or, um, so sorry, child sexual exploitation or child criminal exploitation, it's really important that we think about the notion of a child within that. So child sexual exploitation and child criminal exploitation go up into the age of 18. Um, they don't stop at the age of 16, particularly in relation to CSE, when we start thinking about the age of consent. That can create quite problematic conversations um, with young women in particular, where they maybe aren't recognizing um, that that perpetrator is, um, is grooming them or abusing them, they may view them as a, as a boyfriend, they may say that they are over the age of 16 and that therefore they can consent and therefore you shouldn't be worried. Um, it's really important that we kind of really unpick that and think about wh whether or not we are worried. So over the age of 16, there are certain things, um, certain legislation, certain um, 
certain areas that we would continue to be worried about. So we would still be thinking about grooming, both in the online and the offline sense of it. So physical face-to-face -face potentially grooming, but also online through social media or the internet, whatever technology. Uh, we also need to think about an uh, abusive position of power. So that may be that that young woman is in a relationship with, uh, say, someone who is a teacher at their college, or a teacher at the school that they used to attend, or um, for the context of this call, a, a doctor or a nurse. It could be that they're in a relationship with a youth worker or something like that. So um, we would be really concerned with that being the case, and we would go down the abusive position of power route and LADO as well, obviously. Um, we also need to think about indecent images. So I think young people often aren't aware that actually it's illegal uh, in this country to possess produce or distribute um, any image of a child under the age of 18 uh, that is there for a sexual nature. So that means that if you're under the age of 18 and you take a photo of yourself and you um, have that on your phone, that means that you've now produced child pornography. Uh, if you send that on to someone, excuse me, if you send that to someone, that means that you've now distributed child pornography. By the very nature of having it on your phone, that means you're in possession of child pornography or an indecent image. And that person that you send it to is now also in possession. And if they send it on, that then they're now in the, pro in the business of uh, distributing. Um, that's not to say that the police are in the business of trying to prosecute uh, young people who where they are maybe sending an image that to their, their partner where it's a consensual type image. Um, but in terms of the eyes of the law, that is where it stands and, and young people are often very unaware of that so it's really important to be having those conversations with young people because they may not realize that what they're doing falls into that. Um, can we have the next slide please? Okay, so we need to think about challenges uh, when we're working with young women. So these speech bubbles are all things that um, doctors, nurses, social workers um, have said to me over the last few years uh, of reasons why they, they feel unable or feel um, that it isn't their area to explore some of these concerns further. So things like what if I do something wrong or I tell them the wrong information? What if I get a negative response from the young woman? Um, what if I lose their trust? And really importantly, what if I do something wrong and put the young woman at further harm or risk? Um, these are all really valid concerns and worries. And my next few slides will hopefully start to address some of these. Um, but I think if these are anything that you are thinking yourself when you're when you're working with a young woman or when you start having a conversation with a young woman, um, then it's really important to speak to your to your colleagues, um, maybe to whoever is supervising you and, and seek some support around that because you don't have to do it all by yourself. Uh, next slide, please, Najet. So professional curiosity. So here we're thinking about things like uh, boundaries of confidentiality. So keep coming back to it. Keep explaining to young people or young women what you can keep to yourself and what you can't. It's really important. Young women know when you're being genuine. So please show an interest in their life and, and mean it. Um, in terms of the rapport and trust, don't expect young women to disclose straight away or even at all. Um, it's really not a failure on anyone's part if they don't expressly disclose something to you. And in fact, um, it's been re the research has shown that apparently only one in 12 young people feel that someone of their age would be likely to report or talk about experiences of sexual violence or exploitation. And if they were going to report it, then they were far more likely to report it to a peer rather than someone in a position of authority, um, which when you think of it like that, only one in 12, that's a, a really small number. Um, next slide, please, Najat. Ah, here we go. So again, um, try to speak to young people by themselves, um, but also <laughs> to caveat that and to say almost the opposite, it can sometimes be really useful to have another person present when you're thinking about exploring issues. So it may be that actually having that direct one-on-one -on -one conversation feels like too much pressure for that young woman. Read the temperature of the room, and if that's the case and it feels safe and you have a colleague that you can bring in to help, then do. Um, using third person examples is really useful. So you may use sentences such as on this slide, if a young woman was worried about this, then this is what I would advise. So you're not putting the emphasis on her directly. You're kind of talking around the topic um, and get them to teach you. So ask questions, get her to explain language to you. Uh, language is something that is absolutely crucial. Um, 
So we have to think about our own perceptions within that as well. So we should really be used, moving away from language such as aggressive to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to scared, from did not engage to we did not manage to engage her. Oh God, we've got five minutes. Okay, we're gonna have to whip. Okay, let's do the next slide. There we go. Okay, so asking open questions and being direct is really important. Um, so think about what it is that you're worried about. Ask her directly. Um, you may be able to say, listen, I've met a number of young women where actually I'm really worried about um, the abuse that they suffer on social media. Is that something that you can identify with? Have you heard of that happening to others as well? Start a conversation like that. But please, 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 when you're having these conversations, bear in mind who else might be at risk. Think about that um, and, and consider what kind of safeguarding referrals may need to be made as a result of that. Next slide, please, Najat. Gosh, they're slow slides, aren't they? Next one, please. Here we go. Okay, so some practical tips. Think about swapping out with a colleague. If you're feeling unsafe yourself or if you're really struggling to um, gain a rapport with that young woman, then maybe think of there's someone else who may be more able to do that. Acknowledge disclosures and address them directly. So if a young woman tells you something, do not pretend that she didn't say it. Um, explore that with her and explain what you're going to do next with that information. So also think about recording. Is it a fact? Is it an opinion? How would it be read if it was used in court? So if a young woman comes in and the concern is rape, please ensure that rape is what is written as opposed to sexual assault, because particularly in the eyes of the law, those are two very different things. And if those notes are needed in court, that's really, really important. Um, also, I mean, probably most importantly, acknowledge that that young woman is the expert in her own life. So she will tell you what it is safe for her to tell you. Um, really, really keep that at the center of all of your practice. Najet, next one, please. Okay, case studies. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm gonna read through uh, a couple of case studies. Really important, if you guys could have a think about um, what you would be worried about, what you might think her priorities are at that point, if there's anything that you would like to flag. If you wanna pop that in the chat box as I'm reading, that would be great. So we can start thinking about some of these young women's vulnerabilities. So these are two young women who came into our hospitals in the last year, and both of these young women we worked with for significant periods of time afterwards. Uh, so Hannah. Hannah, 15, was brought in by ambulance, having taken a significant overdose at 2 a.m. in the morning and was unaccompanied. A note had been found that said that she wanted a break from the pain. Hannah has been to your hospital three times in the last six months for self-harm. Hannah is seen by CAMS in the morning where she denies suicidal intent and says that the incident was triggered by the breakdown in her relationship with her boyfriend. She stated that there had been lots of infidelity and that he'd been asking her to be nice, in inverted commas, to some of his friends, which she didn't want to do. She said that she wanted to teach him a lesson. Okay, next slide, please, Nijer. So you meet Hannah when you start your shift in the morning. You observe that she is anxious and keen to leave. She's frustrated that there isn't any Wi-Fi and she wants to go home. You take your time to introduce yourself gently and she tells you that she's been sad for some time now as her older brother has been recalled to prison. She thought that he wouldn't do anything to cause that because he'd promised her. She tells you that she has a social worker but that she hasn't seen them for ages and that she doesn't like them anyway. She says that she wants to go home. So I'm not seeing anything in the chat so I'm guessing you guys aren't too worried about Hannah but hopefully things will start to pop up. Okay, Molly. So could I have this? Oh, here we go. Thank you, Nijet. So Molly's story. So Molly is a 17 year old who has come into the emergency department with a broken nose and is crying a lot. She also has bite marks on her neck and hands. Your colleagues have tried asking her how this has happened. However, she just keeps crying and tells them that she just wants to go home. When the nurse goes to add notes to Molly's record, she sees that there's a CSE flag against her name and that during a previous presentation, it's noted that there are gang concerns, in inverted commas. The nurse said that Molly is getting impatient with all the waiting. Yeah, so self-harm recurrent, I'm seeing that bite marks. Yes, the bite marks were human. Uh, Emma, that is true. Um, 
So you go to meet Molly in the department. She's reluctant to talk to you and says that she doesn't want to get anyone into trouble. You take your time with explaining who you are. Molly discloses that her boyfriend hurt her. He is 28 years old. She is upset as her parents have found out about the relationships and kicked her out because they disapprove and she has nowhere to go. Molly is really keen to leave and doesn't want to stay to see the consultant. Molly hasn't been to your hospital before and tells you that she isn't known to social services. She says that as she is 17, you don't need to tell anyone outside the hospital that she's been there. Okay, so what have we got quickly? Hannah, what does be nice mean? What we'd want to explore, What? Uh, who is her boyfriend? Yeah, does nice refer to CSE or group sexual assault? Very potentially, Hannah, yeah. Uh, age discrepancy between Molly and her boyfriend, yes. Um, you guys are all picking up on some of the, the key flags here. So one thing I would state, particularly about Molly, when we're thinking about human bites, or bites in general, but human bites, um, we need to think about whether or not that's in relation to a sexual assault. It can be a, uh, it can be a sign of um, sexual violence. So it's, it's an ideal time to potentially explore whether or not you would be referring her to the Haven or the, or the associated SARC to your hospital, so the, the Sexual Abuse Referral Centre. Uh, no spa safe space for Molly as she no longer has family home. Yeah, exactly right. So now we're also concerned about homelessness. Isn't known to social services, may not be the case. Exactly right, Farah. Um, just because a young person or a young woman in particular tells you that they aren't known to social services does not mean that this is the case. And even if this is the case, it would still warrant a mass referral. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Najet? I'm sorry, guys, that I'm whipping through this, but um, time is not our friend. So things to consider. Uh, who is she coming with and how is that person behaving? So even if you think that they are behaving in a way that you would deem appropriate, it would still be advisable to try and get that young person or that young woman by themselves. We know from research and we know from experience within our services that perpetrators are really good at hiding that that's what they are. They're really good at appearing nice and caring and worried. And therefore we need to give young women space to be able to tell us if that's not the case. Um, has she come in unaccompanied? That may be appropriate, but it probably isn't. Uh, does anyone know, else know that she's here? So young people often have their location on their social media. Does that mean that people are now aware that she's at your hospital and does this potentially place her further at risk? It's really important to consider that. Um, is there anything you can do to encourage her to say? So do you have youth workers on site? Do you have play specialists? Do you have another member of staff who can be able to sit with her for a little while and keep her entertained? Could you advocate for her to be admitted onto a ward that may be a safer space for her to be in? If you have time and it's safe, could you go and get some food with her so that she doesn't want to leave the hospital so that she can be properly treated? Um, and if you need to make safeguarding referrals, ensure that you've followed all of your hospital safeguarding. So you've reported to the hospital safeguarding team and fo made, followed up on any actions there, but equally that you've reported into the MASH, your local MASH uh, team or made a referral to the social worker directly if you know who that social worker is. Um, next slide. I think that's all we're going to have time to cover from me for now, but I just want to really quickly talk to you about something that you can all sign up for if you are interested. So here at Red Thread, we have something called the Hive, which you can see here, hospital-based interrupting violence exchange that was set up uh, for existing and emerging hospital-based violence intervention programs to support, advise, share ideas and insights and encourage the development of new services. So if you are interested, if you go to our website, you'll see in the top right hand side there is something that says hive sign in or register i think it says if you click on that you can register and that will give you access to all of the resources all of the videos everything that's on there um, so you can get yourself involved and i would strongly encourage you all to do so thank you very much for your time everybody oh i think we're we need to questions questions at the end just yeah. the and that's and the red thread we've put the red thread link um in our resource packs too but we'll also put it within the chat in a second um yeah um i can see there's a question there but i'm going to hold that to the end if that's okay and i'm going to get Dwayne to jump in because he's got lots yeah. to say thank you so much jess you did so well um i'm going to talk a bit at the end that we're going to try and bring these two amazing people together at the end and do a bigger workshop but we'll talk about that at the end um and i'm going to say goodbye to jess but you stay there for questions and hand over to jess um to Dwayne even <laughs> Hi guys, um, thank you for your patience. Um, so similar to Jess, I'm going to be talking about um, parts of youth violence, we're going a bit more deeper into the youth violence. Um, so if you go to the next slide for me please, Najat. 
So I'll be talking about what OIS does and how violence affects young people and basically how you as professional doctors, um, what role you play in identifying um, how violence is seen. So if you go to the next slide again. So um, the next slide again, sorry. Like titles. So that's our wonderful team. So you see me there. Um, Rita is one of the youth workers which works predominantly with women and my manager Tom there, he basically heads up the whole of the youth department. Next slide, please. So just a brief look at what Oasis does. I know that slide's a bit compact, so I'll kind of break it down. Oasis is um is kind of like a community hub and it's broken up into different segments. So we have the hospital intervention, which I do in A&E, and you have the other segments, which is based around a community. So we work, we have a primary school, secondary school based in um, uh, Oasis South Bank in Waterloo. Um, we have uh, a debt agency, we have health space, which is quite new. We've got funding of 124K to deal with some of the obesity in the area. We have a library, we have a coffee shop. I don't know if anyone's been down to Waterloo um, Oasis Hub and seen the coffee shop there. And we also have different projects going on. Next slide, please. So um, what we do is we work with young people aged 12 to 24 um, that present to the hospital if it's a, a violent altercation, anger issue, mental health. Um, and we work with them holistically within the community. We tried not to work within a hospital setting just because that's a place of trauma. And we want to kind of remove that place of connecting that trauma. Um, and what we do is try to link people into things in the community, things we're good at, and trying to find ways to engage them to not be in situations that involve violence. Next slide, please. So, um, where are we? Okay, yeah, so um, this slide basically talks about how knife crime is in the UK right now, because I think a lot of people that work um, for the NHS, they're aware of what happens in the UK, but some of the things that are communicated by the media are very toxic and very dangerous messages about young people and violence. And it's really about kind of informing people about the right thing. So stabbings in London has been at its highest um, since 2002 to 2003. Um, almost most people that are killed from um, violence involve guns or knives. Um, and that age group is 15 to 24 accounted for 12% of the population. I believe it's gone up recently too. Um, I won't go too deep into those figures, but as you can see there, it says 11 to 25 year olds have been referred to youth workers um, for the hospital-based interventions. Next slide, please. Um, this slide kind of talks about different people which work um, with young people and the things that they said. So I'll briefly go over a few which I feel are quite important. So one, I, I'll say the teachers, because teachers are quite paramount in, um, you know, work with young people and they, they see a lot of things. And this is kind of having a public health approach. Um, a teacher here said, I generally believe that the majority of these young people don't carry knives to hurt or murder. They carry them because it's the done thing to protect themselves without considering the stark reality of what it could result in. And unfortunately, young people live a different reality to what we live. And, um, they leave their house and they're presented with an array of different things that I'm going to share later on in the slides. Next slide, please, Najat. Thank you. Um, now, this slide is very important. Um, I know that some of you will recognise some of these faces that's been in the news. And I call it the tipping point because this is the time I believe youth violence began to increase and a lot of people didn't. It was quite big things that happened, as you can see. Stephen Lawrence, um, he died in eight, when he was 18 in 1993. Damanola Taylor, um, he died when he was 10. I think he was one of the youngest that have died from serious youth violence. Um, Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare, that was in Birmingham. Um, they both got shot. Um, and Reese Jones, which was 11, um, that got murdered in Liverpool. Next slide, please. So as you can see, there's a slide here, it shows some of the faces of young people that have been from the Lambeth and Suffolk um, borough, but some of them are outside and they're aged between 11 to 25 as well, um, which is quite sad. Um, next slide, please. 
So moving forward, we kind of have to talk about knife crime being a public health issue. And what that essentially means is that it's looking at across board um, professionals, how we can all help to keep young people safe. And that includes you as doctors as well, being involved in that process of documenting um, information correctly. A lot of stuff which um, Jess spoke about, um, making sure things are worded correctly on referrals, just so that when we get the referral, we're able to assess um, where the young person's needs are and, and better help them. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about some of the drivers for youth violence, and um, these are things that I've seen within the work and some, some of it outside. So as you can see, the young people feeling the need to defend, protect themselves, negative perception of safety, um, influence from peer groups or older people, and that's more around grooming, um, impact on personal and community trauma. So, for example, you look at George Lloyd, how that's affected the community massively. That's a huge traumatic situation, which is being spoken about now on news. And I know in my organization, we've been kind of dealing with that too, how we can best support young people. Um, exposure to violence within the family. So that's more talking about domestic violence and incarceration. Um, drug related activities. I don't know if anybody's heard of the term county lines. Um, you could put that within the chat if you're not sure. And I'll answer that later if you're not sure about what that means. Um, financial motivators, so there's a lot of young people which come from poverty backgrounds, which are out selling drugs to try and pay the rent in their house, um, which is quite shocking. Um, carrying knives for intimidation or to gain respect, and again it's going back to that culture of this is the reality. A lot of young people would rather protect themselves and be in a situation where they're going to be on the front of a newspaper. Retaliation and escalation, and that's more to do with gang involvement um a sibling rivalry um where young people go and retaliate and this is quite a big thing which jess also spoke about sorry jess i'll be using a lot of your references because there's good slides there um social media um and music videos which is also used to push messages of violence um and it's quite a taboo subject for a lot of young people because they see music as their outlet however it is using as a big driver to pass on violence and what Jess spoke about as well, CSE, which is child sexual exploitation. And we have a lot more cases with women, but we also have those cases with men, which is not really spoken about either. Next slide, please. Um, the next slide of the video, um, I just really want you to listen um, to what these young people are saying. Um, if you could press play, please, Ninja. Can you guys hear it? Thirteen. Have you ever, have you ever been attacked? Yeah. How does it happen? You can be in a certain area, wrong place, wrong time. Is that drugs? A lot of drugs, but then nowadays they just silly you trying to have a problem with you over nothing. Why has it got so bad? I think mainly social media, or Snapchat, Instagram. Certain people say things and it just escalates. Are you carrying those now? Yeah, we've all got something on us for real, for real. So that quick video, let me just translate it. Is this still playing? Or stop? Well, look, let's be serious about this, boys. You know that that is designed for one thing and one thing only. Have any of you had friends who have either been stabbed or killed? Yeah. And you still carry knives? I've got to protect myself. The father, uh, also, not every young person carries a knife, do they? Hard to kill. So just, I know, I'm not sure if you guys heard that clearly, but those are two gang members which actually did an interview with Ross Kemp and they spoke about why they carry knives. You saw that big um, knife that got taken out, that's actually called a Rambo. Um, it's quite dangerous, as you know. Most young people, when they stab the young person in their stomach, they twist it because they're, they're aware that that's where the large intestine is and they know that it's gonna amount to death. Um, if you heard what he said, he said, that we don't wanna carry knives, but we have to carry knives for protection because other people will be out to get them sad reality but that's what our young people are dealing with right now so i'm now going to speak about a term that i used earlier called county lines um it's got many terms i grew up with it being called going to crunch um some young people now call it ot um but the professional term is county lines 
and county lines is basically a drug distribution system which is used to peddle drugs and a uh, majority of the cohort are young people um and they're transferred from london to to um outside london um brighton um you know places where it's about an hour away um which i'm going to go to a case study later to show some of the examples of um what of young people that have been involved in county lines but if you look at the images there you can see the conditions that these young people are living in are extreme conditions and most of the times the place that they stay in is called a cuckoo house or a bando and that's where the drugs are made it's normally with um individuals which have mental health problems the elderly um blatant disabilities um and they basically take over that house and they run that house and drugs are peddled through and this um system of county lines is quite extensive next slide please so um there's a few um statistics about county lines um, saying that there's 1,000 well, there's 1,000 plus more gangs um, operating, and I want to go into what the term gang um, really means because I feel a lot of people appropriate gang behaviour with young people that wear hoods, and you know they look mischievous and intimidating, and that's not what a gang is. A gang is an organised um, network of people, and um, if, you, if you've seen anything like Gangs of London, that's been on um, I think it was on Sky Atlantic. That's an extreme example of what gangs are like. It's organized, it's organized, it's not run by young people. Um, so um, I just want to ask you guys a question. How much do you think, um, averagely in a year, county lines make? So if you could put in the chat box right now, how much do you think, um, averagely, a year is, is made from county lines? Don't be shy. Millions, yeah, six million, three million, millions, millions and millions, yeah. Um, last year it was around 3.5 million. Um, and it's gone up this year to I believe five or six. Um, so it's quite extensive. There's a lot of money made. Um, and just so people know it's not marijuana which is being sold, it's class A. And those are they normally call those G packs, which are about this big. And we get a lot of young people coming in with um, injuries from having to plug, which is where they put the drugs in their anal. And we get a lot of those injuries coming through a &E as well. Next slide, please. So we've got another activity when it clicks. There we go. Um, everyone knows this um, logo, which is FedEx. What do you see? Just tell me what you see in this logo. FedEx, <laughs> yeah. Anything else stand out? An arrow, okay, we've, we've, we've won. I'll send you a box of chocolates, am I forgetting it correct? Um, so yeah, the arrow, which is right in the middle of the, where the jet is pointing, um, perception. So we could look at that and nobody would read, nobody's seen that for a while. For me, I, when I was in a conference and I saw it, I was like, I'd see purple and I see orange, but I didn't see the arrow in the middle. And sometimes in our place of work, we can miss those things based on our own personal perceptions of the way that we see life. And I know that working in a hospital, it's a very chaotic environment. There's a lot of processes that you guys have to remember, but I feel like young people, I like that arrow and are often overlooked. Next slide, please. So we've got another activity here. I like to get people involved. Um, when all the pictures load, I want you to be very honest, no judgment, and tell me what you see from these photos. Gangs, yep. Youth violence, yep. Weapons, yep. Intimidating. Bravado, perfect. I like those examples. Um, lots of young people, peer pressure, children. 
a lot of different views here. Um, when I put this picture together, friendship, belonging, you know what? I never considered that one, friendship. Family. Fam, yeah. <laughs> um, now, I selected these photos to do another perception thing. If you, everything that's in common here is young people, the way that they dress and the way that a lot of these um, organizations, fashion houses, um, market their clothing for young people. A lot of young people are seen in tracksuits and hoodies. And just going through some of these pictures, the top left um, is a gang photo. The one in the middle is actually a street dance group. Um, they're actually about to perform. The one on the top right is a rap group called Section Boys. Um, the one directly in the middle is an advertisement for college. Um, the one next to it is a group trip and the ones at the bottom are all gangs. But like I said, yeah, it's a sense of identity. A lot of young people wear the clothing that they wear, it's a sense of identity. And we really need to look past that as professionals because if you look at a young person, the way that they're dressed and a lot of these young people they can be intimidated when they come through a &E, and there's a lot of reasons why they're um, intimidating coming through a &E. It's a public place, and a lot of them are afraid that when you guys deal with them, that they're going to be reported to the police. Young people don't recognise that. Yeah, exactly. Some young people don't recognise that they're actually in a gang, and some people can see them as a gang when they're walking as a group of friends for protection. Next slide, please. So it's kind of, uh, I, I see it as unconscious bias. Um, and as it says there, as a, a brief definition, it's uh, so social stereotypes or certain groups of people um, that individuals form on their own um, conscious awareness. So I could have been attacked by a group of black boys. And I now, every time I see a group of black boys, I now feel like I'm gonna get attacked. And I've come across that in my a &E training with a lot of nurses that have had situations where they've been robbed or they've seen things on TV and they automatically think, oh, those group of people, if I see anyone that's identified like that, they're definitely going to rob me. Sometimes that isn't the case. Young people are vulnerable when they come through a and &E, especially under the age of 18. And I think people forget that young people are very vulnerable. And you look at the mind, the mind takes a long time to develop. And at the age of under 18, there's still a lot of things that their mind hasn't developed in, especially when it comes to trauma. So this is why sometimes when young people come through a and &E, they present to be intimidating, angry, aggressive. Most of the times they're afraid, but they're not going to say I'm afraid because they don't have trust in, in adults. But we'll get into how we can help that later on. Next slide, please. So this talks about what, what you hear. So if you just click a few for me in the jet. So young people will say I'm OK. How is this going to help me? And that, that could be a sign of intimidation when you ask a young person, you know, about their lifestyle. Some young people present and say, I want to kill myself. Thank you. Some young people say, I want to kill myself. Some people will deflect. Some will say, I don't need you. Some will say, I've tried that. No one cares about me. It is what it is. But that's not a reason to not engage with the young person. Next slide, please. And click a few so they can come up. Yeah, there we go. So some of the things that we should be hearing is you might leave me. You won't get it. I don't feel safe. I'm not good enough. I'm damaged. I'm scared and I'm not lovable. As adults, we have that emotional intelligence. We should have that level of emotional intelligence to be able to see. And I know it's hard when you when you're dealing with these young people, because sometimes it takes a lot of confidence to speak to young people especially if a young person is shouting at you or a young persons, I've heard um, doctors say, I'm short and these young people are tall and I feel like they're tiring over me. So I say, okay, why don't you pull up two chairs so you're equal level? You don't need the young person to be standing up over you. You don't need to be standing over the young person to show your power. Sit at the same level as them and have a, a, a natural conversation. But I'm not gonna mirror um, some of the tactics because I feel like Jess really covered it quite thoroughly in her last presentation. Next slide, please. And I want to leave you guys with a question before I get to my case study very quickly is, are you trauma informed or are you trauma aware? And both of them are two different things. You could be informed about trauma, having 
all the information about it medically, but are you aware of how it really affects young people from a psychological, physiological point of view? Next slide, please. Um, that's just how we make referrals. Um, if young people come in through fighting, stabbing, shooting, blunt instruments, any weapons that are used on possible county lines. Next slide, please. So I know I'm rushing through it. Um, my case studies, yeah, next slide. So um, attended um, ED with an asthma attack. We met the young person on the ward who she shared that she'd been bullied on, but on, on her local state by teenagers. She presented with anger issues, but we later found out that there were safeguarded concerns involving CSE. Um, her sessions were focused on anger management techniques and self-esteem, daily affirmation, journaling and meditation. And that was mainly to deal with her anger issues. But in terms of the CSE and some of the mental health problems that was discovered, she was referred to CAMS to unpack those issues around the CSE stuff. And um, now um, the outcome of that, she's in a much better place emotionally. Um, she actually aspires to be a police officer. That's something she's quite passionate about. And we referred her on to counselling to further deal with some of the trauma that she dealt with. Next slide, please. And this is an example of um, County Lines. This is a male attended a and &E after punching a wall. And we get a lot of um, these injuries, um, but these injuries always have stories behind them. A young person saying they punched the wall because they were angry. It's kind of finding out why were you angry and why did you do that? And you find a lot of time these young people are in severe situations. As you can see from this example, three months into the intervention, the young person was kidnapped by a local gang and was groomed and was found 124 miles outside of London. Um, and that's a prime example of modern day slavery county lands, which I spoke about earlier. And we work closely with social care to um, unpack some of those issues. And um, we also referred the young person onto St. Giles. They have a great um, county lands division um, service that we use all the time. And that intervention lasted for eight months. Next slide, I think I may have a little bit of time to do a third one. Um, attended um, ED again, punch injury. Um, we met the young person while they were being triaged. Four days later um, into the intervention, we identi I identified that the young person had a cannabis issue. Um, a drug issue at the place of where they were going, um, their pupil referral unit. And um, we got the young person into paid work, um, lined up an appointment with Phoenix House, which deals with drug um, and alcohol abuse. And thankfully that young person went on to um, doing some stuff with the Prince's Trust and appeared in a fundraising video for the Mayor of London campaign. Next slide, please. But that should be it. So yeah, lastly, these are some of the things that young people have said about working with us. Um, one of the best things about working with us is that we're, we're, we're flexible and able to talk to. It allowed them to think about their future. Um, they were able to talk about their problems openly, being able to talk to someone every few weeks um, because they never had that kind of support in their life. Next slide, I think I'm done. Yeah, thank you guys um, for listening. If you have any questions, I'm sure you'll you, you it out. Yes. So if Jess can put her face on there too, that'd be great. Um, I, we had one question, um, which was to Jess, which was, what's the prevalence of um, young girls um, experiencing um, sexual assault? And do you think there should be a red thread in every ED or even an oasis in the ED, every ED which is yeah. for both of you? <laughs> Yes, is the very simple answer yes. to the last bit. <laughs> um, the prevalence of young women that are coming into hospital um, is really high. They're often spoken about in this term that uh, is quite, it can be quite a frustrating term. You hear this thing, hidden harm, um, that they're, they're not hidden. It's just that we're not asking the right questions. Um, it is our role as professionals to engage young people and young women um, and if we're not asking the right questions of them or if we're not making them feel safe enough then they're not going to be providing us with the information that would warrant that concern. Um, it's about being really curious, it's about not taking things at face value. So for example like that uh, case study that we went through earlier with Molly where she had bite marks 
um, that could be easily explained, oh, I was playing rough and tumble with a with a friend or whatever. Uh, it's about exploring a little bit more of that to say, well, I'm a bit worried because actually those are quite significant marks um, and trying to create that safe space to, to elicit that disclosure if she feels safe to do so. Um, particularly when it comes to sexual violence, ideally we would like everyone to feel able to disclose and ideally we would like everyone to be able to have a safe experience um, going through prosecution. However, we know the reality isn't that um, and therefore we cannot expect every young person to disclose. All we can do is make them feel safe enough that if at any point in the future they felt able to, they have that experience of talking to a safe adult, of talking to a safe professional and they know that they could go back and access that again. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah. Dwayne? Yeah, it's perfect. Dwayne, is anything you want to add? Um, no, I think you covered it perfectly, Jess. Thanks, Dwayne. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, guys, before we say goodbye to these two amazing people? I'm going to take that as a no. Um, so I think you'll agree we covered a hell of a lot in this session and you guys did really well to whiz through parts of it. And I'm really sorry I was the annoying person doing time. Um, but actually, um, I think we, I think this is the type of stuff as paediatricians we need to be aware of. And I'm super passionate about that. And hopefully I'm going to recruit these two to a bit more training for us. Um, so watch this space. Um, please fill in the feedback session so we can just um, know how to rejig it. And thank you to you two for just being absolutely incredible, so knowledgeable, so passionate and I've absolutely loved getting to know you putting the session together. You, so we're going to say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> no worries.